Welcome to Cross Border Tax Talks, where we discuss the latest trends in international taxation, from U.S. tax reform to the OECD's latest developments. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's U.S. International Tax Services leader. You can follow me on Twitter at XBorderTax. This week, we're in PwC's Washington, D.C. podcast studio, also known as my office, where I'm excited to be joined by PwC International Tax Services partner and value chain transformation leader, Alex Velasco. I'm also joined by Marco Fiacadori. That's right. How'd I do? Very well. Very well. All right. Marco is a partner in our transfer pricing practice. Alex and Marco, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having us. Well, I'm really excited to talk about this reg package, which we have waited a long time for. But before we start, very important question here. Is it FDII? Is it FIDI? Is it FODI? I think DeFranzo has some other acronym as well. Marco, I'll let you start. Um, all of the above. Um, we'll get somewhere, hopefully soon, so that people refer to the same things. And what, what, what are you betting on? What are you so voting for? I, I think FIDI will probably go through all right, more, more successfully. You know, people need, need a way to, to get quick, quickly to the, to the bottom, right? I'm a FIDI guy myself. Alex, where are you? I think if I'm more in a formal setting, like in a client meeting, I might say FDI with friends or in a more laid back setting, I say FIDI. I, I like it. Yeah. I, I like the, the, the formal and informal. The yeah. Yeah, yeah, very nice. All right. Well, maybe for our audience that isn't quite as comfortable with the acronym for this is foreign derived intangible income. This was a provision that was put in place to encourage the intangibles to, to, to stay in the U.S., and before maybe I dive in, before we dive into some of the regulations and some of the nuances of Section 250, Alex, can you just provide a, a general overview of, of the statute? And I, I touched on the policy, but just a little bit more detail about what Section 250 does and really a, a major change into how the U.S. taxes intangibles and certain streams of income. Yeah, the... Um the mechanics of uh, foreign-derived intangible income provision, FDI or FIDI, as we're talking about here, is uh, governed by um, the Internal Revenue Code, Section 250. Um, it's the same section that gives 50% deduction for guilty inclusion, same mechanics. Which we've um, talked a lot about here on the podcast so far. So. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so the... The basic mechanics is that Section 250 provides a deduction equal to 50% of foreign-derived intangible income. Um, what is foreign-derived intangible income? It's basically uh, deemed intangible income multiplied by a fraction, and the numerator of the fraction is foreign-derived deduction-eligible income, and the denominator is total um, deduction-eligible income. And the, the rules spell out each of those acronyms and what that means, but, you know, Generically speaking, the, the denominator of that fraction is the taxable income on the U.S. tax return with certain addbacks for guilty support of income, uh, dividends received from foreign corporations, foreign branch income. Um, and then the, um, the foreign, de uh, foreign derived deduction eligible income is what we'll unpack here in a minute. You know, there's certain specific types of income derived from services or property transactions mm -hmm. that may and the rules and the proposed regulations get into a lot of detail on how to determine those. Yeah, so do you yeah. want to unpack that a little bit, Marco, as far as the, yeah. the types of income? So in terms of income, it, you know, broadly speaking, it's trying to address export. And export here means something very specific with respect to what the U.S. Treasury is now proposing regulations on. Export could be of you know, tangible property, intangible property, or services. Now, by export, I mean something that refers to effectively some form of uh, use or um, consumption, disposition, you know, happening outside of the U.S. Now, because supply chain is very complex, uh, that may have an obvious answer when you have consumers directed sales, for example, um, but you have more complex issues when um, it's an intermediate product when you, the services are potentially provided to, um, you know, a business where the business uses that services in various locations, including the U.S., um, as well as intangible property, which could be at that point already commercializable or in process and ultimately 
the commercial use could be outside of the U.S. or within the U.S. So it creates some form of questions around the contours, the perimeters of where exports is really truly non-domestic from a U.S. standpoint. And the rules are sort of, you know, it's a good attempt to try to put some, some framework around it, knowing that the statutory language is fairly broad and, um, you know, although they want to provide a benefit, of course, they, they also are aware of uh, creating too much um, leverage in, in accessing this 37.5% statutory deduction on what would be ultimately considered FDII or FIDI. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about that 37.5 deduction because the, the statute, I think, was intended to operate, and this actually goes back I don't know, almost 10 years to a Chairman Camp proposal with a, the carrot and stick approach, which has sometimes been referred to with respect to offshoring of intangibles. And you're yep. absolutely right that this isn't just intangibles, it's services, it's product as well. But I think from a big picture perspective, at least the way I, I think about it, was that there is this, you know, what, what was referred to at least in the conference report is this minimum tax concept, which is guilty, which says that, you know, if you're not paying at least a blended rate of 13.125% overseas, that you will then have some residual U.S. tax. And we spent a lot of time talking about expense apportionment and QBI and all that stuff with respect to guilty. But from an FDII perspective, the idea was, well, if you leave those intangibles or even those property transaction services transactions back in the U.S., the concept was they wanted to be able to have the similar favorable tax rate and not incentivize U.S. companies or U.S. taxpayers from exporting those property transactions, intangible service transactions. And the mechanism by which they did that is under the same code section, Alex, which you referred to, which is Section 250. But the way they did it from a U.S. perspective is that they said, well, 37 instead of guilty, which has a haircut as a result of the foreign tax credits, because there's no haircut with respect to foreign tax credits in the U.S., it's 37.5% deduction. Right. So the concept being that the income that is eligible for FDII is effectively subject to tax in the U.S. at 13.125%, so that there can be some parity between whether it's earned in the U.S. or whether it's earned offshore. And then similarly, from a guilty, like guilty, you also have to look at your U.S. depreciable tangible assets and assume a return like we have to do from a guilty perspective for purposes of determining your, um, your FDI, your FDII. We've also, I've heard people mention and have read that arguably that disincentivizes intangible or tangible property investment because it otherwise potentially reduces your ability to be able to uh, take your, your FDII deduction. And there's a lot of those policy questions. I mean, obviously, like the big picture of the policy is sort of obvious. You know, the, the intent of the, this particular carrot, the FDI or FIDI, you know, is really a mechanism to counterbalance will provide people with some incentive to either keep or move economic value drivers onshore into the U.S. But like with anything else, there's numerous questions as we kind of seeing the, you know, the regulations being issued, finalized about whether these policy actually, you know, having desired effect. And there's numerous practical questions about what behaviors they yeah. drive, et cetera. Yeah. And, you know, it's portable income in some sense, right? The, the, the acronym of intangible here is really any excess return over and above the Q by 10%, right? So it's portable income that could be through the company arrangements or some form of structuring um, to some extent shifted. Um, now, with economic substance or a number of things, but the, the idea there is to um, really focus on parity, the 13 and an 8% being the threshold, at least, you know, on paper. Right. Uh, yeah. And I might argue how portable is that? It's really just exactly. to, to your point, it's just anything in excess of return uh, on, on your depreciable yeah. tangible asset base. Yeah. But then when you, you know, bring this concept into the regs and into the actual business reality, right? So that, that portable means something specific, right? It could be income earned through transportation services. It could be in income earned through sales of widgets. It could be income earned by licensing a particular IP. So it, it creates um, a number of specific questions and potential risk and opportunities around characterization and proper structuring and proper documentation we'll see uh, sort of around what really gives you and gives rise to that benefit and how, how sustainable and how important is that benefit for 
for the group or for the for the domestic corporation that has um you know that it has a carry in into the tax department for for you know running the analysis you know being being able to prepare the the sort of the filing for the tax return. Yeah, so let's talk about that because th this th that I think is one of the really important things that came out of the proposed regs. So a few weeks ago, we finally got the proposed regs on foreign derived intangible income. And we have we did a tax, I think both of you guys, we did a tax readiness series. So we've got a bunch of stuff that's out there. If you're interested in some of the detailed mechanics of those regs, obviously we don't have time to get into that on today's podcast. But maybe Alex, we'll start with you, just some some highlights or or lowlights, whichever your perspective might be with respect to the the proposed regs. Yeah, I'll run through a handful and then we can maybe spend a little bit of time unpacking certain types of income and what makes it eligible or not, you know, right. under the proposed rules. But maybe some some highlights are, you know, big picture, um, I kind of think of it as three main requirements to determine whether something is eligible for FDI benefit or not. One is whether a sale or service, you know, is foreign derived um, under specific rules that are prescribed in the regulations. Number two, whether the taxpayer knows or has a reason to know whether a particular product is destined or service or an intangible is used. And this is a bit of a novel concept. There's a lot of questions about like, you know, how do you actually know or, you know, what makes one believe they have a reason to know. Certainly in the context of third party transactions, there's right. a lot of yeah, services things. tend to seem to be easy because you know generally where your people are, are doing those things. But the property transactions that wind even through with value services, chain. like we have a couple of examples, even with services, you get into these like really strange questions. Yeah. about. But so 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 one is whether, you know, a service or a, um, a sale of, of property is eligible under specified rules, whether a taxpayer has reason to know, knows or has a reason to know where that product or service is used. And third, whether very specified, you know, documentation and administrative requirements have been met. And the rules spell out a lot of those, you know, documentation and administrative requirements. Um, the, the rules address um, in, in very, you know, significant detail. You can tell there was a lot of thought put, put, put in this uh, by the government and trying to address with a lot of specificity, just basic computational and definitional Mm -hmm. uh, questions around, you know, how the income is determined, how, you know, QBI is determined, you know, for this purpose, QBI is determined very similar to how it is determined for guilty, not a big surprise. Mm -hmm. There's specified and abuse rule that tries to prevent uh, taxpayers from taking advantage of, you know, the, the, the computational effect of QBI and moving it around between and it is in a group or in structured arrangements. Yep. The rules um, speak about treatment of partnership for purpose of QBI, basically saying partnership is an aggregate, uh, so it's not an entity. You look through the partnership and its you know, activities and assets, but partnership is considered a person for purposes of determining whether a sale or service is to a foreign person or a related person, which is important. Mm -hmm. um, the, the rules then you know, specify... Um, what, what, you know, specific services or uh, income from sales is FDI eligible. They helpfully clarify that income from Section 3.7 inclusions is um, FDI eligible. The rules address some specific, um, more industry-unique situations like where a sale is made to a U.S. government in mm -hmm. the context of a foreign military sale. Um, so there's a lot of very specific, very helpful clarifications throughout the uh, the rules. And then we get into the actual, you know, definitions of, you know, property transactions and services transactions. And this is where the, the Treasury, uh, you can tell they, they've taken a very nuanced, very thoughtful approach to try to take the statute, which, Marco, as you said, is fairly broad, and try to sort of funnel it down and try to address, you know, what they thought was specific kind of business, business fact patterns. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, high level, the way that it was done was to identify particular items, whether, you know, um, certain types of property or certain types of services and carve specific, um, you know, types. Mm hmm and indicate how to do it in a particular manner and then create essentially a residual category, which is, you know, general services or general property that, you know, in effect um, leaves uh, open a number of questions. And I think it's where most of the issues are now popping up with respect to how to 
really get comfortable and how to to substantiate the foreign news aspect of it. And in, you know, the other thing that were it was particularly helpful. I think it clarified the mechanics of of the calculations. Mm. You know, the the five step rules. You know, th there are a number of things that were really raising fundamental questions in the algebra of, of, of running these calculations that were very nicely addressed, I, I thought. Yeah, specifically, it, it was unclear exactly how you did the section, the NOL deduction, the 163J, right. and then section 250. And there was just circularity. Yeah. And I know as we were building our models, trying to figure out which one yeah. comes first, and now we've got a relatively clear, yep. very clear five-step process very as clear. far as how, how that works. I say that just because I haven't individually been through one of those computations yet. To, it seemed like it was clear in the regs. And then I think, as we all know from going through this exercise of the last 15 months, that once you actually start diving into some some fact patterns, issues tend to pop up. But it seemed that they, you know, did a a, a very good job at trying to create a you know ordering of events. So maybe we dive into maybe we start with some property transactions. And sure. I don't know if you want to maybe give uh, some examples or you know what, what are some of the things that you guys are kind of seeing in practice and yeah, so, uh, you know, so for taxpayers. There is a big difference between property and services, and in fact, there is even a test on predominance of you know, of character, depending on whether multiple items are, are, you know, included in the transaction. And I think the reason is because ultimately working backward, the evidence that the government is trying to get for the foreign news is very different depending on whether it's property and it could be tangible property and tangible property versus services. So, yeah, just to interrupt you, just to make sure that everybody understands, I'm sorry, Marco, is that the idea is, is that that amount of, of the certain types of income that is are eligible for, for this deduction, they wanted to make sure the Congress wanted to make sure that it's only those that are being, that have foreign use. Yes. And that <laughs> seems like, okay, well that, are they is it used offshore That's or right. not? And obviously that is much more complicated than what it would what it would seem. And so from a property perspective, is that property being used and tangible is it being used or are the services being used or performed outside? Yeah. And so that's kind of the, the fundamental question that the regs are trying to That's answer. right. So in general property, um, so general property is a residual category. It's, uh, there is intangible property, which has a specific definition in the code. And then there are commodities and derivatives that are sort of carved out as well. General property is de facto, you know, tangible property in, in, for our purposes, for many of the businesses. And that, of course, um, relates to ultimately um, the, the challenge in proving out that it's not coming back in the U.S. at one point. Yeah, so for, so for, general, for general property sales, um, to determine that the income from that sale is FDI eligible, you have to first establish that a sale is to a foreign person. That's the first requirement. Yep. And there are very specific documentation requirements how you yep. actually establish that it's a foreign person. And then the second prong is that the property is um, sold you know, for use outside the U.S. And the rule basically says the property has to be um, physically, it has to be either sold to a third party outside the U.S. for use outside the U.S. or physically impacted outside the U.S. in cannot otherwise then be round-tripped and subject to U.S. domestic use within three years. Yep. Okay, that's the basic rule. And so you immediately have questions like, so if I'm selling property to a, a foreign person that is a third party, an unrelated you know, customer, then I have to somehow satisfy myself and the treasury that within three years that property did not somehow make it. You know, so in the third-party context, there's one example of just a lot of practical questions about record-keeping and access to books and records, and they, the regulations have examples where certain information is available just by reference to like public financial statements, but like we all know a lot of times that level of detail is just That's, not disclosed yeah, in public. At, so certainly not a lot. transactional level that we are <clears throat> expecting here to. Yeah, so know. I expect there'll be a lot of comments just on or mm -hmm. questions about like, you know, how to, how to apply that. that yeah, and, of, and there is a very dramatic effect in lacking documentation here, right? So it, it seems pretty clear, at least in the current form that if you lack documentation, you are pretty much disallowed that benefit. So documentation will become, in practice, the real action item for, you know, the filing of, you know, of you know, yep. tax returns. Yeah, one of the questions just on that property uh, example that, that you gave, Alex, is what happens when it's component parts? Like if you're selling a piece to somebody else and then they use that piece in that business and then imagine that goes to some other business and it's used in another component and then ultimately it comes back to the U.S. 
I mean, how are companies supposed to, to understand and, and determine where that ultimate destination is? Yeah, the rules um, kind of sort of import some of the concept from support F rules, from foreign-based company sales rules. But curiously, they don't just import them by reference to those rules. They use kind of slightly different words about component manufacturing or transformation of property. Um, so I think one of the questions that I know the companies have been raising is, is there a particular reason why we don't just specifically look to the you know, well-established rules and the support of income and all the case law that goes with it to determine whether something was, quote-unquote, manufactured or su substantially impacted outside the U.S. Or for if this it, purpose. You know, they, they have a test to establish whether it's a <clears throat> component by looking at fair market value, <clears throat> percentages. And so so it, it gets mechanical in <clears throat> some sense, but it's always very factual and subject yeah, it's to very determination. Yep. Yep. Subject to determination that it typically depends on economic analysis or some form of substantiation that it's quantitative, right? As well as, you know, yep. factual. And then for and then there, there there's special rules for related party general property yep. sales, very which important. which are very different. There the rule just looks at, you know, to the extent the sale had occurred to a foreign related party, whether that foreign party sells that property to an unrelated foreign person. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, then that sale is not eligible. And if that sale did not occur by the time the tax return had filed, then you cannot take the benefit of the deduction. You can go back and amend the tax return if it later turned out that the sale eventually was made to a third party. But there's no so, – so think of a common situation where a U.S. entity may make a component part, you know, sells it to a foreign-related manufacturing entity in Mexico, maybe where it's further transformed into something else. And you have a lot of this in certain industries, you know, automotive, industrial products, pharmaceuticals, where you have sort of fragmented supply chains. Right. And then that component may make itself back into the U.S. Maybe it's finished or further manufactured. The initial sale is not eligible because the product eventually made its way back to the U.S., so there's a lot of questions around, you know, was yeah. this really... And also timing that? becomes relevant, right, to, to this point. There could be mismatch, and there are even, you know, rules in the proposed regs that allow you to go back and amend returns if there is a mismatch between the evidence you have available at the time of the filing versus the evidence that will become available after the filing. For example, it's very common to have holding inventory um, through, you know, a related party transactions that goes beyond... Um, you know, the time that you would be otherwise able to, to use as evidence that it eventually went to a third party outside of the U.S. Um, and you are effectively withholding that benefit for, for as long as you have that evidence back and potentially have to amend the return. So a number of complexities. This goes back to the incentives question, I think. You know, it's, it's really at the end of the day, um, seven and seven, eight cents on the dollar at most, depending on the facts. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, you have a benefit. It's a clear benefit, and there is an incentive in, in, in focusing on that. But it's not a dramatic, it's not a huge in incentive. And depending on the fact, some of, of these trade-offs are becoming serious and you know, maybe costly. In some cases, you may, under the documentation rule, you may have to actually ask the third party to provide you with information. In other words, substantial changes to the commercial uncontrolled transactions or in the marketplace where you may have now to request that evidence and lacking that evidence, you, you, it will put you in, in defense and it will put you in, in, a, in a different spot. So point being is that as companies are that have substantial exports, and I want to get into intangibles and services too, but as companies are doing entering into contracts with third parties, one of the things that they should consider is the documentation that will yep. be needed for them to be able to substantiate this foreign derived intangible income benefit. And so get that into the legal agreements to make sure that you can get access, that the <clears throat> taxpayer can get access to the information that they need, because this is a new world order with this FDII. Right. The commercial people generally, the, the business and salespeople would not have thought about that they need to get this kind of information no, to the company that they're going right. to sell. And then also, how does it impact the economics too? Because it's like, all right, well, you need this additional information. Does that's that become right. a bargaining chip then? That's it does. Right. We, it, had, it, it, we had this conversation with uh, senior executives from some of the largest, you know, multinational companies about this very point. And the consensus around the room was, you know, this is how these rules get finalized. They will likely 
cause either different way of you know transacting between Contract. unrelated enterprises or just different flows of information that we never actually saw before. There yeah. was never a reason for that. Like this will actually change commercial behaviors. Yes, yeah. it will create a compliance aspect that doesn't hasn't existed so far. And again, I, I believe comments will probably pop up in the interim that allows. Um, potentially these as a safe harbor you know to the idea that you if you had that hard documentation that's that's a great plus but you may still potentially be eligible lacking those commercial terms that currently are very important in fact are determining the, the mm -hmm. ability to to be to to get the deduction to begin with so maybe we turn to in, intangibles um and and then we can spend a little bit just a few minutes on services sure. but uh so it, I, the way I always thought about you know FDII, at least going go back to the the Green Book during the Obama administration, where we had a Republican you know Congress and Chairman Camp, and really focused on royalties and, and intangible returns, and obviously FDII is not limited to to that. But what are some some practical implications on on intangibles as a result of these regulations, Alex? Yeah. So with intangibles, um, the and, and by Sale of intangible, you know, sales defined broadly, so you can include license and actual sale and installment sale, you know, so any transaction by which an intangible right is conveyed. It's transferred. Um, to establish where IP is used, the regulations tell us we have to look to the place where the revenue is ultimately derived. Um, and uh, it sort of seems kind of intuitive, but it actually raises a lot of questions for companies that, you know, license and make available intangibles, for example, that are used in the manufacturing. Like not all intangibles are used in actually deriving sales. In fact, there are some types of intangible property that do not result in sales at all. Think about, you know, a pharmaceutical company that may actually use IP and further development of an indication that never see a light of day in the right. market. You know, so what if there are no sales? Or what if IP is in licensed used in the manufacturer? Or what if it's used in the internal business operations, you know, to render services, for example. Mm -hmm. So the rules really don't address that. So that's that's contrary to the way we always thought of this, both from the you know transpricing perspective, but also just based on the existing case law that tells us how to determine where the intangible is used. Yeah. And so there is partial disparity here with the tangible property, for example, where you have intermediate manuf you know, for, foreign manufacturing that would allow you to achieve that benefit. You don't have really for foreign further development of IP or other concepts. It could be analogized at least from uh, from the tangible products. The other big issue is again going back in the, into third parties and not only necessarily immediate third parties because there are licensing of IPs that are for further development or further integration by third parties for customers. Right. And so it's a double leg step out of the group um, where you now have to prove. Um, hypotheticals, really. It's it's, it's really a, almost a realistic, um, you know, uh, guess at that point mm -hmm. of what are going to be the uses, and, and this creates a huge, um, you know, huge question on how confident you are with the analysis that you have and the data that you have that will allow you ultimately to prove that a fraction, maybe a hundred percent, but depending on the <coughs> facts, maybe just a fraction of the income earned by that license or by that sale. In fact, is eligible for the for the benefit. Um, in, in, I think we're going to see a lot of questions around intangible property, exactly because the intangible nature of the property is, is kind of squishy, right? So it right. goes, it's difficult to catch, and it's difficult also to prove where the ultimate use and sort of um, consumer's location is going to be, right? Yeah, and the just the breadth of different fact patterns. To your point, Incredible. Marco, is just <clears throat> it's it's so hard and. Every company, every business defines its intangibles differently. Even within particular businesses and industries, companies will define those types of intangibles and returns differently, even if the businesses are exactly the same, frankly. Right. So it becomes very difficult, I think, to understandably for Treasury to try to write rules when it really is such a intangible, amorphous yeah. topic. And this is why, I mean, just from a big picture perspective, I think, is the audience, I think, is probably starting to get at this point. These rules are highly, they're very complicated. They, uh, they try to sort of boil the ocean a little bit into a number of fact patterns, but you know, just the way the modern economy has evolved, it just, I don't think, fits in all the fact patterns that the rules contemplate. So there's a lot of holes that are unanswered. And where, where people at first understood the policy behind FDI provision, and they read the statute, and the statute seemed fairly broad and, right. and favorable and 
you know the number of number of companies were reading the statute and saying hmm, i think this you know makes sense i fit the patterns they read the proposed regulation and they may just draw very different conclusions so i think there are some industries that are really clear winners you know beneficiaries of this uh, but i think for most companies it's gotten you know fairly nuanced to figure out yeah and the other practical consideration assuming the proposed regs stay as they are which is an open question to be fair mm -hmm. but um you know, there will be cycles of audit. At the very least, the first initial audit will be an interesting and tough one, I think. But then potentially, I think we're going to see a little bit of, you know, uh, more stable, uh, you know, practice and, and understanding and, and, and implementation of these rules in the real life situations, right? So I, I think, you know, there will, we'll have to, to navigate a little bit the transition from this very broad language in, of the statute, this um, you know operational language that is coming from the regs, which I have to say you know it's a, it's a fair attempt still, nevertheless, to to try to put in, into life some of the concepts, and yet you know the the challenges of the real world that that are out there no matter what, and will continue to evolve depending on on how the economy goes and what kind of of tech patterns you're going to face. Yeah, maybe last but not least, then services. Um, yeah, really quick on services. Yeah. I mean, services is my favorite. So the, the rules introduced four types we, of we, we welcome pointy-headed tax nerds <laughs> where services of the FDI I just love these are, rules. Yeah. Are, are somebody, I'm glad you have a favorite. I would have been disappointed otherwise. I was just really impressed by the amount of thought that went into the... Um, and I'm not being sarcastic, right. but... Um, Either so, am I. <laughs> so the, the rules, uh, they lay out the four different categories of services. Um, Proximate services, which are services performed in proximity to the customer. Um, so think of maybe uh, consulting services where a provider travels to the location of a customer. Um, the property services, the so services performed in proximity to property, but the but but this this um, uh, type of services requires that uh, the provider of services also physically manipulates the property. So ser service has to be in proximity to property and also physically manipulating the property to be considered a property service. Um, transportation service, which is obvious, and then catch-all, which is other or general services. Um, the, the property services, um, just by based on reading of the statute and the words in the statute, which talked about a service that's eligible is a service that's either uh, provided to a, a foreign person or with respect to property located outside the U.S., um, that that reading seemed fairly you know broad and generous to companies as they read the statute the requirement that to qualify for property services um you need to be in proximity to property and physically manipulate it really i think narrowed down the funnel you know that that companies would be able to take advantage of that particular category and you really think of more kind of like repair services maybe you know where somebody travels abroad to be in proximity to property physically manipulating it mm -hmm. um, and then it's interesting when you think of this kind of category of services and also compare it to the foreign branch income right and you kind of need to thread the needle a little bit where services are performed outside the U.S. in proximity to property while physically manipulating it but not so much of that as to create a nexus in the permanent establishment that gives rise to maybe foreign branch income which is not eligible at all for FDI so it's a bit of an interesting dynamic there. And then for, for the catch-all, for the general services, the use is going to be determined based on where the recipient of services is. Um, and then in the context of business-to-business -business services, the regulations tell you that to determine, you, you kind of look through the recipient to where the services actually provide economic benefit to the recipient's operations. So here's another example where you're providing services to a third party, say a foreign customer, but that foreign customer may be a, a foreign multinational which right. has operations around the right. world, including in the U.S. You somehow need to ascertain that none of those services would be also somehow benefited in the U.S. If yes, then you need to curve out, quantify that portion of the services income and sort of back it out of your calculation. Yeah. Well, so, so I think I think that's a that's a good a great summary from from a services perspective. Maybe here in, in closing, we'll just ask you guys for, you know, 
tips, tricks, advice. I, I think maybe I'll start and then let you guys, maybe Marco and then sure. then Alex, you give closing. I think my, my first advice, and this is something that we've been, I think, very consistent with all the various reg packages for taxpayers is get, please get involved in the process. And as we've talked uh, to former members of Congress and 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 Treasury and even member you know former members of the U.S. Treasury Department, Pam, otherwise that they are looking for it, it for for comments input. and input, absolutely. And so that would be my first piece of advice. But but Marco, what other words of wisdom do you have for our listeners on 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 FIDI? On FIDI, um, I think first, you know, we haven't talked about 2018, but 2018 is a year where those these proposed regs are not applying. So do some reasonable analysis and actually the proposed regs talk about it. So in, in that sense, thinking about the urgency, uh, 2018 is a little bit of an odd year, but it's an, op an opportunity for everyone to you know, go through the economics and, and the conceptual aspect that may not be subject to the proposed regs. And then work uh, through some of the specific issues, but I think the expectation is there will not necessarily be a full benefit uh, and by that meaning, it's going to be hard to prove that 100% right. of the gross income is, you know, eligible. But there may be good amount of, um, you know, return in the investing uh, uh, resources and time in figuring out the right footprint, uh, as it's going to be effectively the way going forward that for many years or for a number of years we'll we'll expect. The benefit will be realized. So, yeah, this is a whole new work stream for for, for taxpayers. But but there's a lot on the table as far as potential tax Very savings. Much so. And so starting and, and, early. And, and to some it. extent, just to be clear, I mean, it sounds like this is it's extra work and it's but it's really converging because of the interdependencies with other work streams. You may already have to do a lot of work factually, for example, to go through the expenses on the type of um, activities that are happening for other reasons, for guilty for. 59 cap for other stuff that at this point you may want to um, you know complement that work stream with an activity that includes FDI analysis so that you're effectively taking advantage of other work streams and you know don't come up with a new completely um, separate uh, effort that really it's not required it's required to be holistically taken from from you know from the overall perspective good advice any last words of wisdom from you Alex um, Maybe the top ones in my mind are, um, while this provision can be very beneficial to companies, it's highly nuanced, and it's turned out to be even more nuanced and complicated as we thought just by reading the statute. Constant um, theme with the TCGA, I yes. think. Yeah. So modeling, like quantitative modeling, I think is going to be really fundamental to this because it's limited by U.S. taxable income. You have to factor in expense apportionment. So even, even before we're having a serious conversation around fact patterns, and whether to make certain changes in the way we contract or think about exports, just fundamentally understanding numerically, you know, can, what we, is even the drive, size? can we even drive the benefit? Just and what's the size the of the price? And, attributes, right. you know? and then um, it's highly nuanced analysis. I think the, the administrative requirements and the diligence needed to satisfy the various prongs of no has a reason to know and then documentation administrative requirements are going to be fairly substantial. Um, if you combine this with, you know, just open questions about the, the foreign non-U.S. response to FDI, um, we're already seeing some of that, like in countries like Germany, for right. example, as well as just some open questions about, you know, longevity and kind of legislative political environment. I, I think there'd be more companies trying to understand how this provision fits their existing business and try to take, you know, most advantage they can under the law. I don't think many companies will be making bold moves until some of that uncertainty shakes out. Well, we'll have to leave that as the subject for another cross-border tax talks, but the WTO and non-U.S. implications of this provision is a whole nother topic. So thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Cross-Border Tax Talks. Thank you, Alex and Marco, for shedding some light on an incredibly complex topic. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's U.S. International Tax Services Leader. Stay tuned in two weeks for another exciting edition of Cross-Border Tax Talks. Music